Hello, everyone. Welcome to the DMV Business Show. I'm your host, Odo Sevilla, and today I have a very, very special guest for you, Miles Powell, the owner, CEO, and founder of Eight Miles. Welcome to the show, Miles. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to get the audience to get to know you as a person before we go into your story. Are you originally from the DMV area or where are you from? No, I actually grew up in Philly. Um, I'm a DC transplant. I moved down here in 2015, uh, I'm sorry, 2017. Okay. So going on to five years almost. Yeah. So I'm like, I mean, I feel like DC is pretty uh, transient. So I feel like now I'm a native. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've done your time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so exactly. I guess you grew up your whole, I mean, until 2015, your whole time was in Philly. So I, I started out, um, well, I grew up right outside of Philly in, a, in Delaware County, um, went to college at the University of Delaware, which is in Newark. <clears throat> I graduated in 2012. And from there, I moved out to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and spent some time in that region, um, Harrisburg, Lancaster, Reading. Uh, I was working as an engineer. So I did that for the first, I guess that'd be three years. Um, like I said, 2015, moved down to D.C. right after that. Got it. Okay. So you, you grew up just outside of Philly then, right? Yep. So <clears throat> basically 10 minutes from the airport. So Got right it. on the edge. So gr growing up there, what, how were you as a child? What were you into? What did you like to do? You know, it's funny. I think about it now. Like I had a wide range of aspirations. So I wanted to be a weatherman at one point. Uh, I, was, I don't know why I was fascinated by weather. I wanted to be a basketball player like everyone else I knew. Um, but once I got to high school, I stopped growing. So that ended that, you know, that journey there. And then um, an architect, because I used to love Legos. And then in high school, I realized that architecture, you have to learn how to draw. And I'm not good at drawing. So that ended that. And I think I finally landed on engineer, which is actually what I, what I went to uh, college for. Okay. What type of engineering did you do in college? Civil. I took the easiest one possible. <laughs> So yeah, I did that. Um, and it's funny because that was just based off of, I mean, I was good at math. I liked science. Everyone in my network told me engineering is a great career. Um, you should do that. It pays well. You'll be set for life. And I'm like, okay, well, that sounds like a great idea for me. So um, went to engineering school and got my butt kicked. I mean, like this is the hardest of ever, well, at that time. I never worked so hard at school. And coming out of high school, things were relatively smooth, right? I mean, I finished top 30 in my class. I mean, I tried, but it wasn't, I mean, I got to college. It was a, a different animal. I'm, I'm looking around like, I'm not smart. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was rough. Wow. Well, I, I can see a little bit of similarity since you were into Legos and you decided to go into civil engineering in the end. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was, you know, I, I used to like building things and, um, what I wanted to do was get into like roadway design, bridge design, things like that. Transportation, essentially. Sure. Okay. And you said you went to college where again? Jersey? Uh, University of Delaware. Delaware. Oh, Delaware. Delaware. Okay. Delaware. Okay. So yeah. You graduate from University of Delaware with your civil engineering degree, and I guess you're ready to take on the marketplace. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and actually, so just to back up a bit, my sophomore year in college this is this is a year after like failing most of my like I was struggling in engineering and I'm like this isn't for me but I'm in it I decided to take an elective in uh business economics okay and and the, and, and the back and because I, so I grew up um with folks who were entrepreneurs right so they were part-time entrepreneurs they had my dad had a catering business my mom helped out with him my, my grandpa actually ran his own business for many years and so they also they told me you know engineering is great but what you want to do is eventually own your own company. So I think that seed was already planted. And so my sophomore year, I had to choose an elective. And I said, you know, I, I want to learn more about business, to see what it's about. So I took an economics course and fell in love with it. I mean, it was like the first class I took where I was like interested. I understood it, which was, you know, I didn't understand engineering, but I, I got I, it came naturally to me. So from sophomore year on, I started picking up more and more business courses and then I guess at that point, it was like, I want to get a business minor. So, and so I, I did that throughout the course of my undergrad. And um, so that's what I graduated with. It was a civil engineering background with a minor in, in business economics. 
That's great. I didn't know, Miles, that, you know, growing up at a young age, you were exposed to entrepreneurship at home. Yeah. And, you know, you know, being young, it probably didn't have a huge impact on me, but that it was in the back of my head. Right. Sure. Yeah. And I knew I said, I, I want to do a, I want to start a business one day. But in my mind, it was going to be a engineering business because I went to school for it. It wasn't until later where it kind of made a different decision. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Uh, were, were you growing up, were you helping out also in the business with the catering or you would just see it sort of, you know, from afar? I mean, I would help out a little bit. You know, I would go to events and help help out. But it was more of a, not a chore, but it was like just to be helpful, right? I wasn't thinking like, this is going to be mine one day. It was yeah. just like, I'm going to do it to help out. Sure. Um, I just didn't know how much I would enjoy later on. Yeah. So you, you had in mind, maybe I'll have my own engineering company one day. That, that was the thought, I guess, graduating from college, right? Right. Yeah. Me and all my friends that I went to school with, you know, we said, hey, one day we're going to be at the top ranking of the engineering company. We're going to run it. But it's funny because like, I knew at that point I didn't like it. Like, and, and this was a really, so I, I, I want to say a couple of years after I graduated, what I realized is that I don't, I didn't like engineering, but I enjoyed the challenge that came with it and the feeling of accomplishment, you know, because you put me in, you know, I, I was like going to interviews and I didn't feel like I was a fit anywhere I went. Um, it was hard for me to get a job. <clears throat> it was like the world was telling me engineering is not your thing. Um, but at the time I needed to work, right? I was excited to start my career, make some money. So I did get a job um, for a utility company as an engineer. And it was cool because it was, it was an engineering position, but it was tied in with a lot of business stuff, like, like the sales piece, the finance piece. And that's what I really wanted. So doing that, it was like another uh, trigger for me to be like, oh, you really love business. And so that so then that's when I decided I'm going to get my MBA because I definitely want to start a business and I need to have more of those tools under my belt. OK, when you're working with this utility company, is it still in Delaware or where? So this is when I moved out to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. OK, um, OK. Maybe two to three months after I graduated. OK, so you relocate for this job then, right? Yep. Yep. Relocated out there. Um, it's, it's like my first time being an adult, right? You know, out of college, I'm ready to do adult things. And so I was really, really excited. Funny thing is, second day on the job, I'm sitting in my cubicle and it's like 930 in the morning. And I remember I had this moment of, I got sat back and I went, you mean to tell me I have to do this for 40 years <laughs> in, in this setting with like high cube walls and like, you know, coming in at the exact same time setting my alarm at the exact same time in the morning. And I, I'm like, I, I can't, like, I, there's no way I got to figure out what I'm going to do differently. So that started the, like the, the really, I started getting into like, okay, what lane am I going to take? Sure. So was it then there miles that you said, maybe not engineering and maybe let me look at other lanes or were you still sort of focused on the engineering one day opening your own firm? At that point, it was more of, I didn't want to open my own firm, but I was still pretty dedicated to engineering. Like I had a career path, but it was, a, it was like a career path of settling, right? Like it was like, this is the path that I could do. I could work in this stuff for the next 30, 40 years and probably be okay. But it wasn't my passion and I wasn't thrilled about doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I started taking like, you know, those career aptitude tests, like trying to figure out what I really like. Nothing was landing. Um, but at the exact same time, because I'm living on my own now, I don't have much of a friend group, you know, at the time. And so I, I my hobby was cooking. Um, I had learned to cook when I was younger and just was just do it periodically as I grew up. But when I was on my own, had some money, went grocery shopping, I just started cooking and I just like found joy in that. Um, so in my spare time, I would um, start creating recipes. And I said, oh, I'm going to create a recipe book with all the things that I've created, make some money that way. So this is before Instagram. This is like when it was just Facebook. So the way to get notarized, like, not like, you know, known wasn't by posting recipes online or posting them like to a social media channel. It was a blog. It was strictly a blog. So I started my food blog, put my recipes out there, hoping to gain some vision, you know, some traction and was doing that, you know, and doing engineering. Engineering is still the full-time gig, but this food thing is like really starting to like, like trick, like, you know, I'm really starting to really enjoy it. Around what years is when you start doing the food blog? This has got to be late 2012. Okay. Um, so I was, you know, and so for, you know, between late 20, this is a couple of months after I started working full time. 
So I'm doing that and I'm really enjoying myself. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I wanted to do a, a, a cookbook. And um, so I started entering recipes into like contests online, trying to push it that way. At the same time, I'm now going to grad school. Um, I started grad school in 2013, a year after I started working. And so I'm, I'm like, I'm literally doing all these things, right? Trying to figure out what's going to work. And then a year after doing my blog, this is like, this is probably the moment that changed everything. I was looking for a place to submit my recipes for consideration for some kind of contest. I came across a casting call online. It said calling all home chefs to the next uh, big food network show. And it was all it said, no details, no nothing. And I looked at it the night before and it was late and I'm like, Hmm, I think I put it on Twitter and I said, wouldn't it be crazy if I like submitted and someone I grew up with, they said, just do it. So the next day I submitted my, my blog, my info, didn't think anything of it. Maybe a couple of months later, I get a phone call and it's the Food Network and they're like, hey, we want to interview you for this show. I'm like, I don't know why, you know, I've been, I've been casually cooking for a year or two. So we have an interview, we talk about what I do and, and hang up the phone. I'm like, all right, that, that's probably it. Um, oh, maybe a couple of weeks later, another phone call. And they're like, hey, we want to talk to you some more. And now I'm like, it's really happening. And then um, a couple of weeks later, it's, this is probably around October of 2013, get that phone call saying, hey, we want you on this show. Can you come to New York in a couple of weeks? And I'm like, oh my God. And that's what like that was that was the point of I must be like fully invested in this food thing because wow. I end up, end up going to the Food Network. Back then, Miles, were your recipes mostly focused on a specific type of food or cuisine, or were you pretty much doing all different things? It was everywhere. My whole the whole I guess premise of my blog was to showcase that someone who's like me, um, young, you know, no professional training. African American can just cook really well, and so my, and, but it was it was focused on food that's not healthy because at the time I was like anti salad, right? Okay. So I was making all kinds of crazy recipes like bacon wrap lasagna and all kinds of stuff, because um, that's the food that I really enjoy. And so I was, you know, I was never I wasn't professional, right? And like looking back on some of these recipes, I'm like, I wouldn't cook that now, but it's it was all creative. And that was the okay. whole the whole point. I think that's what Food Network liked. Okay. So it was all you and I guess your spin on things and doing things differently then. Exactly. Got it. So then you're at a point that, am I quitting my engineering job and heading up to New York to film this or what? I guess it took vacation time or what happened? Vacation time. Yeah, okay. it was a really strange thing because I couldn't tell anyone what was happening. So I went to my boss and I said, hey, and you don't know how long because it depends on when you lose or win. So I, told, I think I told my boss hey, I've got to go away. It's around the holidays. I'm like, I got to go away to New York for something special. I can't really tell you what. I don't know how long I'm going to be gone. It may be a day, maybe four. And he was, I mean, he was nice enough to say like, you know, just keep me updated. Yeah. Um, so yeah, man, I, I, I just, I remember for the week, I was still in school, like grad school, but at, on, the, on the side of that, I just started studying like how to prepare things I didn't know how to prepare because I didn't know what to expect. So I just spent all night YouTubing stuff. And the day came when I took a train up to New York and met like, you know, the rest of the contestants there and realized that it's a, so, cause I didn't know if it was going to be chopped or if it was going to be like um, America's worst cook yeah. in my head. I'm thinking, I hope it's America's worst because I can compete there. If it's a chopped, I'm going to embarrass myself. And, um, and we didn't find out till the actual day we were shooting what it, the format was which was, these are America's best home cooks. And I'm like, I'm way in over my head right now. Oh gosh. And the whole shooting was for how long? So I went up there one day, I was there for three days total. Okay. Um, because I got, I got, so spoiler alert, I got cut episode one. So I was only there three days. Okay. Um, but it was, it was a show in which you had 30 minutes to cook a, a dish. And uh, they gave you the, the protein you had to use and they gave me duck and I never cooked duck in my life. So the whole experience was just, and I mean, they were cooking late at night. I mean, it was a whirlwind. I remember after we were done filming, I knew I was going to go home. I was like, right, there's no way I'm making this cut, which is 
in the back of my head, I'm like, fine, because if it's any harder than this, I'm going to definitely be horrible. And I remember like the feeling of getting on the train, leaving New York and uh, getting home. And it was just like, it was surreal because like, I can't believe that like, I just did that. I, I was I was literally filming for the Food Network, but I came home and I said, food is it. I got to do something with food because like this, this fits like a glove. So what do you say? You decide still to continue with your engineering career, the MBA, or what? You still continue that track? Yeah, because that was my comfort zone. Sure. Still, right. I was like, I'm going to finish on my MBA, keep doing the engineering thing. Um, but I'm going to start a business like on the side. Okay. I'm going to find some way to do food. And around that same time, I had started making barbecue sauces just as a to play with them. And I love barbecue sauce. And I created a, a recipe that was really good. And I was shipping out samples at this time. This is right around the Food Network experience. I'm sending out samples to friends and they're like, this is amazing. And I said, you know what? I'm going to start a business making barbecue sauces. Um, back, this is 20, 2015, um, 2014. I, well, I made the decision in 2014. And um, I knew nothing, right, about how to start a business. I'm in grad school, but we weren't learning that kind of stuff. Um, I just kind of winged it, right? I just would, did a research online and um, took me about nine, six to nine months to figure everything out from the, the packaging to the branding to the trademark, all that stuff. And then I launched. I just said, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And so I launched Eight Miles in 2015. And at the same time, I moved, um, I'm sorry, 2014, 2015. I had just moved to a different engineering job and, uh, and still in central Pennsylvania. But now I'm working on parallel paths, right? I've got the business, engineering, like both are gunning forward. The business obviously being new is very slow. I don't know what I'm doing. The engineering thing, I'm really, I'm like, I'm making money, but I don't see a path forward where I'm going to like enjoy what I'm doing. And I said, you know what? If eight miles ever grows to a certain extent, I'm jumping ship and doing business full time. Now, the, the name eight miles, where, where, how did that come about? Man, it might, it's like a, it's like a, uh, it's like a legend that, is never going to be told because I don't remember. So, I, but I do know. So my thinking is, I remember, I remember I had a list of business name ideas. I would share with a couple of friends and I think eight miles is on the list. And I think one of my friends picked it and I okay. said, yeah, I think that sounds good too. Um, I'm a big fan of motivational movies, um, you know, kind of started from the bottom type movies. And so I like eight mile a lot. So, and I just have a good play on words being my name. I said, sure. yeah, I'm going to go with that. Okay, I see. That's good. So then your parallel path that you have the barbecue sauce and what, what happens afterwards? So at this point, you know, grad school is coming to a close. And I knew I wanted to move somewhere that's a little more lively than central Pennsylvania. Um, I, at the time, I'm, you know, I'm 24, 25. Like, I've still got the mindset of, like, I want to have fun on weekends mindset, right? And I didn't have a huge social network where I was at the time. And I said, you know what, I want to go move to like a bigger city, um, better opportunity, right? But I was going to move with engineering. That was going to be my base. So it was either New York, Chicago, or DC. Uh, I had been to all three and I loved all of them. And I said, wherever I go, I'm taking eight miles with me and I can scale the company. I have more opportunity. And the moment I finished grad school, I got a new job. I mean, it was like the moment. Um, I moved down to DC and, you know, wanted to, Wanted to be part of a city, right? I wanted to have experience, have fun. Um, this is this is May of 2015. I moved down there. I'm sorry, 20, 2016, I believe it was, or 2017. Time flies. Um, so I moved and I got this job. And this job I hated. I mean, like with a passion. I've never, I've never hated a job in my life. And this one, like, I couldn't stand from day from day from day two. I was like, it was horrible. And I lasted three months. Wow. And I said, you know what? At this point, I've been doing eight miles for two years. It had kind of plateaued because I didn't spend enough time on it. I said, you know, I'm going to quit my job and do eight miles full time and figure it out. And so I took a leap of faith and quit and became a full time entrepreneur. And this was in 2017, right? Or 2018? This 20, this was, uh, if I'm, my timeline is serving me correctly. This was 2017. Okay. Yeah, this would have been summer of 2017. 
Miles, and this job that you didn't like so much, was it engineer related? I, I know you got your MBA or was it business finance or? It was, it was uh, back to, it was more utility work. Um, oh, so okay. it was, it was, in, it was construction, um, got it. you know, but I was an engineer and yeah, it just, I didn't like the company. I didn't like what I was doing. I, my hours were insane and I, I felt trapped, you know, and I was like, Ugh, I don't, I gotta do something different. So I quit and um, yeah, started full-time entrepreneurship. At that point too, live, you were living in the city in DC. Yeah. So you, you were doing your barbecue saw still from home, right? So at this point, well, for the first couple of months, I was actually traveling back to PA to make my sauces, which was insane. Um, but I actually found a new kitchen in DC a couple of months later to make my sauces out of. Okay. Okay. And that's when you went full force hundred percent with eight miles. hundred percent. But I didn't fully think about how expensive DC was. Like, I, I mean, my, my cost of living went three X from coming from Pennsylvania. Sure. And so maybe two months into doing this full time, I said, I got to get another job. So I ended up picking up a part time job, then a second part time job and eventually a third part time job. So I was, you know, working overnight hours I and mean, I was I was pretty all over the place. And at the same time, I still didn't really know much about running a business like from at least within the food industry. I had an MBA, but I had no idea how to do consumer packaged goods. So I, you know, I made some progress here and there, but nothing significant to the point where I could say I can do this and be comfortable. So after seven months of full-time work, I was, I'm going broke. Like I, I need a full-time job again. And I ended up going right back into full-time engineering work to sustain living really. Sure. And, and uh, uh -huh. that was down in that. So that company was down in Virginia and, um, the vibe of that, I actually like, I liked the company itself, right? Um, and the work I like to, and it, I was just happy to be making money again. I mean, that was stressful, right? I was, I was broke. I was like, <laughs> glad to be back on, uh, back on the, on the money side. Yeah. It, it, entrepreneurship is never easy. No. Yeah. Uh, so you were working with this company full time, still doing the barbecue sauce as well. Yep. Um, and how, how did things progress from there? So in the beginning, it was so this actually it's funny around this time, I had just started kind of making a company pivot. So for the barbecue sauces, what I would do is I would do a farmer's market and sell the sauces. But to promote the sauces, I would make stuff like chicken wings and mac and cheese so people can use the sauces. And doing that for a couple, a couple of months, people would tell me, you should sell your mac and cheese. Your mac and cheese is amazing. And I said, huh, like, you know, I do love Mac. It's, it's part of my upbringing, comfort food. And at the supermarket, I can't find a good Mac and cheese. And the, at, the, at that point, the sauce is like, they didn't feel like the best fit because of the competition. Um, a lot of other factors too involved. And I said, yeah, you know, maybe I should try something different. So I kept making the sauces, but then I introduced this line of Mac and cheese and I did that via an accelerator program in DC that found me. They said, hey, we love your mac and cheese. You think it's a great concept. We want to help you expand it. So I said, you know what, let's do it. So 2018, uh, around February or so, I joined this program and started building up the mac and cheese part of the business. Engineering, you know, that job is still going on full time, but now I feel like now I have a starting to get a direct, a sense of direction, right? Because like I said, I didn't know much at this point. You know, I'm making some money, but it's, I'm still pretty lost. Mm -hmm. So then you, you, it sounds like the focus then became the mac and cheese, right? And the barbecue sauce sort of just went to the side a little. Exactly. It did. The yeah, mac and cheese became the focus. Um, I started getting the mac and cheese into more like some retail accounts, you know, um, you know, some of your mom and pops, some of your smaller chains, but I could tell it was a better, better traction right away. Like I was, I, I saw it at what I thought I did. Sure. And I was, all right, I'm, I'm making sales and things are starting to come together. This is great. I got a lot of potential here. And the mac and cheese is now the focus of the company. You know, there's one thing, Miles, in the production and the creating of the product. And then there's another thing in the marketing and sales of CPG, consumer packaged good brands. How right. was the marketing sales part of things? Because you were just mentioning here as far as getting you know, getting the product into some local mom and pop stores in the area. It was door to door, right? I mean, the thank, thankfully, 
there is no educational component that's intensive with mac and cheese. It's, you know, it's everyone knows it. I'm, and I come to the market and say, hey, this is a better version of what you currently have. So the pitch is not hard, <clears throat> but you have to be, it's a crowded market. So you have to be aggressive. I mean, driving to stores every weekend, you know, just emailing, every, it's, it's such a grind and you get a lot of no's, obviously. So, and the marketing piece, I didn't have money to market. I just put it on Instagram and stuff like that, but I didn't have any budget. In play. I didn't like, I, I think back to that time, I was just a one man band, right? So there was just me trying to figure everything out. Nothing really formal. Um, yeah, it was just a learn as I go process. Yeah. So you're basically just knocking on, on businesses and then just pitching the product and see if they will put it on the shelf. Exactly. And then once we got enough of those accounts that were had our product, we were able to talk to a distributor, um, Rainforest, who's a, a, a Northeast Mid-Atlantic distributor. Then they picked us up and that started then things. Now I'm like, OK, things are getting a little legit now because now I'm like creating um, official case boxes for my shipping products and learning about distributor margins and all this stuff. So things start to now shift in the direction of this is starting to like build, like I'm getting orders of 30 cases of per, per flavor. And I'm like, all right, now I'm like, I'm seeing four digits on a, on a PO for the first time ever. Like, you know, it's like these like really exciting things. And um, it's like that, that was the point of, okay, I think now this, and my brain, my naive brain was like, this is just going to continue like this. And it'll be like, I have to keep getting more sales and I'll be good to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, did it go that way the whole time? Not even close. Oh my God. I mean, that was the past. So that was 20, I got that distributor mid 20, like summer of 2019. And since then it has been a mental roller coaster because like, I mean, as, as I'm sure you're aware, just like, as you're trying to scale and build, there's so many problems that enter into the uh, into into your space, right? And you're and you're trying to figure it out because you haven't done this before. You can't even predict those problems. So every problem is new, and you're trying to find opportunities, and you're trying to find out which are the correct ones versus the ones you shouldn't pursue. And they got, I mean, it's I'm still going through it, right? But that was, but that 2019 period is when things started to come together. Now, when that distributor picked you up, that changed things you mentioned. For, for yeah. those of you in the audience listening or, or watching Miles that don't know the, the business, the consumer package good business, a yeah. distributor pick you, picking you up helps you tremendously, right? Absolutely. So it's a catch-22 and in the, in, in for, for the industry because you, if you go to a Whole Foods, right, and you say, hey, I want, to, I want to sell you my product. Now, if you're lucky enough to get a contact or a buyer at Whole Foods, that's great because it's really hard. Um, but what they'll say is, who do you distribute with? And if you say no one, they'll say more than, well, not all the time, but more than likely they'll say, come back to me when you have a distributor. And you say, okay. So you go to a distributor, you say, hey, can, I, can you carry my products? They're gonna say, which retailers carry you? Then you say, well, Whole Foods needs you. And they say, well, we need Whole Foods. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really messed up game. Okay. So when you finally get in, it opens up now your opportunities to all types of retail doors. They're not going to automatically pick you up, but now you're in their catalog and they can pick you up if you sell into them. So, yeah, it, it's really it's required. Right. Um, I know I know some folks that sell directly to retailers, but you got to imagine now you're you're in charge of order management, delivery, um, all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So it's, having a distributor means a lot. So, so they pick you up and, and that obviously changes business. And then yeah. you're now, like, as you mentioned, you're getting a lot more orders coming in. And you're sure. still here, just a one man show doing it solo. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was making all the product myself. I had a, I had a hand every now and then, but sure. most of the time it was just me. Um, yeah, solo all the way. Did, did it ever come to a point as far as you now leaving engineering? Because I'm, I know you're still doing it, right? So I actually left last October. Um, so you know, over so you know between. Over the course of the next couple of years, mm -hmm. it was this like slow build, right? Slow build, uh, boom, something happens. Slow build. So it was this roller coaster. Um, it wasn't until last October when I just kindly threw in the towel and said, 
I know that I need this money from a full-time job. I'm not really paying myself through the through eight miles, but by not being able to focus on it, I've been messing up and I ha can't dedicate my time to eight miles to make it to where it needs to be. I gotta, I gotta relive the moment of quitting. I have to give it a shot. And, and so I did uh, last October. Wow. Were you noticing when you make this decision as far as leaving the full-time job, were there things slipping in the business that you said, I, I just need to dedicate more time and attention to it? Yeah. Things like quality control. That was a big one. Okay. Um, you know, I was having meetings in my car all the time and it's not professional, you know, especially if you're trying to talk to like an investor or a buyer. Sure. So I was missing out on a lot of that stuff and I just needed to be involved. And plus from a, from a mental standpoint, I was losing my mind because I'm trying to do two jobs at the exact same time. And I felt like I was being pulled apart. So um, I, I said, I know I'm going to be stressed by going full time, but probably less stressed than if I'm doing both at the same time. Uh, right before you quit your full time job, Miles, so you were working 40 hours a week, give or take, right? Full time. And then you were 50. Yeah. Wow. So 50. And then now you're dedicating probably what? Same amount of time. Well, you need to sleep probably, too. Probably about, yeah. Probably about on top of that, 30 hours, including weekends, 30 hours a week to eight miles. Gosh. Okay. So you have no free time. None, none at all. I mean, I was, and things, and like I said, things are starting to pick up. So that free time was getting smaller and smaller. The, the trigger was, so the moment I decide I'm going to quit soon, we launched in Target in 2021 of May. When I got when I got that business award, I said, "Okay, if this goes well, and I can build on it. I'm gonna quit." Okay. Um, and so then, yes, I guess six months later was when I quit. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. How how did COVID affect business, if at all? So I hate to say it, but it was like kind of a good thing. I mean, for from because with COVID, I was at home now. Sure. And so from an eight mile standpoint, I could do that more at home than I could at my other job. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was I couldn't do store demos with COVID and demos were the, our main way of marketing at the time. So it sucked. And then also with COVID, COVID is actually the reason I got into Target. Um, so right before COVID hit, this is December of 2019, Target, one of the buyers found my brand on a shelf somewhere and he reached out and he said, Hey, we would love to look at you guys and see if there's a potential partnership. So we started talking and then two months later, COVID hit. So they go, well, right now we're going to halt any new brands coming on board for obvious reasons. We'll check back in with you later. But he said, maybe, and so then another month goes by and he goes, Hey, um, our distributors can't keep up. We have empty shelves on our stores. This is not good. Can you just come, just put mac and cheese on our shelves? Like, like, you know, we'll pay you for it, but just go store to store in your local market and put it on there. And I said, of course I can. Um, so I would just do it. I did that for five weeks and just went store to store, put mac and cheese on their shelves. And what it did was Target was able to get sales data from me, you know, based how they move product. And we were able to develop a really good relationship. So then when the time came again for review, they were like, yeah, we want you on our shelves permanently. How many local stores here in the area did you go to? Uh, I think it was eight or nine. Okay. Yeah. And then now you're permanently in all those eight or nine stores. So now we're in 255, I believe stores. Oh, wow. That's great. Target. Yeah. It was a full Northeast expansion. Okay. Maybe soon nationwide open for it. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Was, was that a game changer for the business miles? It, everything, yeah, everything changed. I mean, so from a retail standpoint, we doubled our store account. Um, we went from like, I think maybe 150 or 120 to, or no, we had like 220 because we were in, it was, so we had been building up before target, right? Like, like little by little. Sure. And at the time we were in like 250 stores. So when Target came on, it doubled our store account right away. But now we're in a national retailer. So like, but I'm learning about freight. I'm learning about all kinds of stuff I didn't know about. So this is where, this is the moment where I'm like, I'm spending all this money. Like I've never spent money like this in my life. I'm seeing like all the roadblocks involved and the whole scaling thing starts really coming into play. And, um, but 
from a present standpoint, by telling retailers you're in Target, it gives you a whole new look. And now I'm starting to see like significant growth into other retail chains. Okay. Okay. Now for Target, you said all, this is all the North, the North, is it just Northeast or all the whole East coast? Just Northeast. So between okay. Virginia and like up towards Connecticut. Got it. Okay. Now with all this growth, obviously you, you basically need to feed the beast, whether financially to, to fuel his growth. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I underestimated how much though that's, and, and to be honest, that's where I see most brands failing is that during this period, they're not funded enough and they just go broke. I invested a lot of my own capital because I, at this point I'm six years in and I'm like, I'm not going to let it fail now. So I just gave pretty much put all the money I had into it. I'm just feeding this thing. And I, I you know, to be honest, I kind of still am. Um, I mean, we're getting investment dollars now, but I put a lot of capital into this because I needed to get over this hump of scaling. Um, yeah. It's a beast. And I'm sure as you continue to grow and you continue to expand to more stores, whether Target and other non-Target stores, same situation. You have to continue to recycle. Yeah, you still have to get you still have to get investment dollars. It's the only way it works. I used to when I was first starting the business, I didn't even think about investing. Like, I didn't know about it. I thought it was like a cool thing. Like, oh, you raise money, great. I didn't know it was a requirement. Like my brain said, oh, you just keep growing sales and you'll cash flow positive and you're good to go. No, no CPG company ever <laughs> has, has done that. And so that's been a lesson, right? And I tell people if I had to do it over again, I, I would have raised money from day one, like pre-revenue, I would have been trying to raise money. Okay. How, how much do you think would have been a good, uh, I guess a good amount for you to be comfortable and be like, okay, this is, this, this gives me enough fuel for the moment. In the beginning, I mean, in the very beginning, you could have started out with 50,000, 75 grand or just to start, right? Sure. Um, and then maybe a couple of years later or so, get half a million, you know, but I didn't do that. So now, so now I'm doing it now because it's super necessary because we're expanding. We're, so we're going national in May. And that's got all kinds of dollars that are required. And so like, I'm, I'm doubling our store account again you know, and trying to hire and all this stuff. So now the money is as needed as it's ever been. Oh, wow. National with Target? No, it's going to be with, um, actually, I shouldn't say just because oh, Okay. I don't know the confidentiality in that. So I'm going to, uh, but it'll happen in May. So, okay. But it's obviously someone we've heard of because it is national. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Big brand, yeah. Okay. That's good. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that's coming with their own set of problems as well, but I hope, you know, it, it, it's, it's a good ones. Yeah. And now that I've, I have a bigger network of folks who have done this before, where I can at least kind of predict those problems. Whereas, like I mentioned before, I didn't know anyone. So any problem was, I just didn't know it was coming. Yeah. What would you say drives and motivates you, Miles? I think it's that, I think it's going back to engineering. It's the whole challenge piece. I, I think the whole like set a goal and accomplish goal, like that one, two step is keeps me going. I had people ask me like, you know, as hard as it's been, as you have you ever thought about quitting? And I've, I've tried to think about it, but my brain just says, you better not, you know, it's like, you can't quit no matter how bad it gets, unless, unless you have no dollars to give and just, there's nothing and nothing coming in. Otherwise you keep going. And which sucks because I also, there's a, a strong business, uh, how would you call it? But they always say fail fast. Like if you're going to fail, do it quickly. I've been doing this now for seven, going on eight years. Or, yeah, right. Seven years. And like, I'm just now getting to this point of like, okay, we're getting there. Um, but, and I think that's what drives me is because I know how hard it's been to get to this point. I, I, there's no way I can quit now. And the, and the idea of what it could become pushes me forward. That's good. I love that. You, you were just mentioning earlier about the growth and the team. How are you finding those players, making sure you, you surround yourself with the right people for the growth? That's what I'm still trying to do. Um, I think it's a really hard thing to do because so now that my network's bigger, there's a few folks who I look at, like I want kind of you involved, but you need money for that. <laughs> so that's why I'm raising money. Cause I want to, I want to, these are folks that I've been talking to for a while now and I've kind of pointed them out and said, you've helped me for free. 
I want I would like for you to kind of be involved on a more permanent basis. Okay. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Um, what advice, as you said, you, you've been doing this for now seven, eight years. Well, what yeah. advice would you give to someone if they came to you and said, Hey, I wanted to open my business, whatever, CPG related, not product service, it doesn't matter. Any pointers? That have helped uh, yeah, you? definitely. I think the one would be know why you're doing what you do. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, because you need to be able to perfectly tell other folks that, like, either it's customers, investors, whoever it might be, you need to be able to explain your passion and, and be confident in it because that's going to translate to everything else. And two, it's it kind of gives you like this body armor, right? Because shit's going to get rough. Like, it's not going to be easy. And if you're just doing it because you think it's a cool idea, you're going to quit. But if, you're, but if you are doing it because it's your passion, you love it and you're doing it for this strong, this reason, you'll be able to withstand those those storms like if i if i went into this you know let's say i was like you know it would be cool if someone created a triangle monitor whatever whatever it might be right yeah as soon as i get my teeth kicked in i would be like i oh, just stupid i don't want to do this anymore but if i grew up loving monitors and like all i wanted to do in life i'm gonna probably stick in it yeah that is true oh, yeah. are I was going to say, are there any specific habits or traits you feel that helped you along the way, whether on your personal side or business? Um, you know what? A lot of it's not. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, I know that's really basic, but thing about entrepreneurship is it can get really lonely um, because you might be surrounded by folks that don't really understand. Not that they don't understand your business, but they don't understand your your, your path or what you kind of go through on a daily basis, right? It is the most, I had this conversation yesterday, it is the most mentally exhausting thing you can probably do as an individual because you're battling everything. There's an analogy that I used. I said, imagine if you uh, buy an office building, it's got five floors on it, right? And you, and you start a business in this building. Each floor is a different department. You've got HR, you've got sales, you've got marketing. The problem is you're the only one in that building or it might be you and one other person and the phone's ringing in every floor and there's no elevator. And so you are going running up and down the stairs all day answering phones. And if you don't answer the phone upstairs, you're not getting a call back and they're not leaving a voicemail. And so you get extremely mentally exhausted by doing this. And I tell folks like find something that you can do that's going to provide you joy outside of business. Um, so for me, it's working out. Like I try to work out at least every other day, um, daily if I can. And it's just like an escape. You know, it's 30, 45 minutes of something that I can control and there's no distractions. It's like the weights, myself. I can put my music on, I'm good to go. Um, and it really helps. Because when I don't do it, I can feel it. Like I, I, I feel mentally exhausted you know it's so funny Miles. i'm exactly the same way every day every morning i have to get my workout in it, yep. it's it's my therapy it, yeah it, you yeah. know I, it, that's how i see it and and it's funny you mentioned it too because sometimes and the rare occasion when i don't get it in my wife could be like you didn't work out today did you <laughs> <laughs> You can tell by the mood. So yeah, because I'm just so much snappier with, with, with uh -huh. you know, um, things get to me faster with, with work or the kids or everything. And exactly. she's like, you, you need to work out. I'm like, yeah, yeah man. <laughs> so true. It's just a way to release that energy and you feel so good afterwards. Yeah, it's, a, it's such a boost um, physically and mentally. So I, I tell folks, if you can do it, please, I highly recommend it. Yeah, I agree. What would you say is your biggest challenge today in your goal at eight miles? It's definitely raising money, right? It's one of the, I, I found it to be a weakness of mine as a, as a, as an individual. Um, I think a part of that is the industry in which I chose, um, you know, right now, everything is, everyone is really hot on tech and like agriculture and things of that nature. CPG, not as much, unless you're playing in certain categories. Like if you're playing it within like, well, it, it was recently like the beverage space, um, but now it's, of course, plant-based is huge. 
Um, functional products are huge. Our, my products are just very good tasting food, which is very simple, but it doesn't really spark the investor like, oh, this is really cool. Um, our traction helps because we have a lot of it, but it's still not the cool space. And it's frozen, which is definitely not the coolest space on the, in the supermarket. Mm-hmm. So that's tough, right? Um, trying, to, trying to convince investors about this being a very good, good deal for them. That's the number one challenge. Um, listen, if, I, if someone came along and, and said, hey, here's a million dollars, things would be a lot different, right? Um, and, I, and I know everyone says that, but in this, in this case, it would make a huge difference in what we can do with uh, the company. So that's that's the challenge and the number one goal right now. Yeah, I, I know that there's several investment groups and private equity groups that just focus only on CPG. And e- even then, Miles, you're coming across that they sort of want to be in other verticals in CPG, like you said, plant-based or other things. Yep, exactly right. Yeah. Um, I've spoken to hundreds of investors over the past 12 months and yeah, if you ask them, they'll say, hey, this is great, you know, congratulations, but this is not a vertical we're looking at right now. So it's tough. It, it, it is tough. Um, but, you know, it's part of my, it's part of how I've been, re- like, over the course of my life, everything seems to be twice as hard as it should be. <laughs> like, like, it took me three pitches to get into Whole Foods the first time. Um, It's all like for me, it always takes me multiple times to try something out. I don't know why, um, but just the way it is. And uh, but that's that's given me kind of this like resiliency. Um, It allows me to kind of be able to go through this roller coaster and not just completely give up on myself. So as much as annoying as it can be, I know it's it's for the good. Yeah. And and, and you need to have that. You need to have it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just part of it. Yeah, I agree. What do you know now that you wish you would have known at the start of your career? Everything, literally everything, <laughs> because I knew nothing, right? So, like, oh my God, yeah, everything. I mean, from pricing, right? Correct, how to correctly price your product, which I thought I knew them, but I didn't. Um, like the investment thing, thing is huge. Like knowing what the money, what money I need to get to a certain place, like knowing my customer i mean literally every single thing that i know now i wish i knew back then i've got this like bundle of knowledge that i've been like man if i knew this five years ago be all it'd be so much better um but one of the things i'm looking to do is transfer that knowledge to folks who were in my position five years ago who are like just trying to figure things out because you can learn a lot from my mistakes more so than my successes i'll tell you that yeah, that's good. And, and how are you doing that? I guess other people in, in the CPG industry or come to you yeah. for advice and okay. Yeah, I've, I've, I posted on LinkedIn like a number of times just saying, hey, I'm here for anyone who wants to talk um, about, you know, who has questions about the industry. And one of the things that I do actually is um, I started a small group of us. Um, I call it entrepreneurship therapy, small CPG folks like myself who just like feel like, yo, I got a vent. Like, this is killing me. I got to I gotta get this mess out of my head. So we come together once a month and we just talk. And it really helps, right? It's not like we don't come with a specific agenda to be like, hey, I need help with this. It's just like, hey, how are you feeling? Like, what's sure. going on in the world? What's bothering you and all that stuff? And it really helps. That's great. And then this group is all over the country or specifically in the area here? It is mostly northeast but i have a couple of folks who are out of the area too smaller group about eight or eight to nine of us um like i said it's i just started it about two months ago and it's just an opportunity to talk about this crazy thing we do um because you can you know the folks in your in your life who love you they're always going to support you but you might say stuff that they can't relate to which is with any job right which is fine so being able to talk to folks that are in it to be like, hey, this distributor's killing me because they'll say, oh, I understand, you know? So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a comfort there. That's good, that's good. Coming to an end here shortly, Miles, you know, you've been doing this now for many years. Are there any mentors that helped you along the way? And if so, what, what did you learn from them? Yeah, so I had a, I actually had two mentors um, from SCORE, which is the uh, small business arm for, uh, from SBA. They were there in the very beginning when I started this company. 
Um, they didn't have any CPG experience, but they were just helping me think about some stuff I didn't know about. So I actually had a conversation with the guy, uh, Steve, uh, a couple weeks ago. I hadn't spoken to him in like four to five years. So it was really cool to catch up. Um, so he helped a lot, right? Um, recently, I picked up a couple of mentors just through networking that really helped me think about some of these decisions I'm making. Because, you know, as I started thinking about investment vehicles and like convertible notes, it's all items that I was unfamiliar with. Um, they're actually able to help me out a lot. Um, same with on the branding side and marketing. I have some folks come in. So I've been, I've been able to connect with a lot of folks who just are willing to offer help. That's good. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. What does the future look like? What does the next couple of years look like for you? Yeah. Um, so like I said, we're going national this year. We're actually doubling our store account with a couple other retailers as well. So by June this year, we should be quite big, which is which is great. Um, it's I'm in this period of like trying to get over, like I'm in, I'm still small, but we're trying to get over like this first tier of being small. Like we want to be at like tier two small business, right? Mm -hmm. And we're close. So the the immediate futures get to that place where we're making X amount per month. You know, we're able to cash flow pretty pretty well. We got investment dollars in place, and now we're scaling. Um, and then by the next year, we want to be like, okay, now how do we expand even more? So it's this is a crucial time of of, uh, of the year for us. Um, I knew it would be, but the if we can get past it and, and do what we need to do, then we'll be in a better place. You, you know, Miles. I Unfortunately, with business, a lot of statistics is, as you know, the majority fail and yeah. don't succeed. Being in this now for all this time, what do you what do you think separates the businesses that fail and the ones that continue and push forward and succeed? It's it's cash and grit. Um, the cash is kind of obvious, right? If you don't have the money to to keep moving, then you got to go. Like it's mm -hmm. <laughs> like if you can't get the investment dollars or you run out of personal financing, then hey, sorry, got to leave. I've been close. I've been really close. I've been like on my last dollar kind of thing, close, right? Um, and then grit's the other part, right? I mentioned it before. It's going to beat you to your knees, and you got to decide like, is it worth it, right? Um, you may be and you may have another other circumstances where you can't you're like hey i have a newborn or you know my mom's sick whatever the case might be where you can't do both and that's you know like i guess i've known companies that were that were at the time doing better than me and they they turn around they're like i quit i'm, like, what? I'm looking at them like you're making all this money per month what's up and they're like mentally i can't do it like i i can't handle it because like it is it's dangerous like especially if you aren't already like if you don't already have that fortitude inside of you like this game will teach you right away like hey you better you better grip up because uh -huh. <laughs> we're gonna beat you up yeah i think those are, the, those are the top two reasons for sure that's good when, when when you're not busy working what do you like to do for fun in your free time definitely work i mean workouts my fun right like that's all it is right now it's like if i'm working out uh, or, you know what I do for fun though? And it's not, I don't consider it fun, fun, but I enjoy it is cooking outside of my business. Like just okay. making dinner. Um, I still like that, that, that creation in the kitchen. I like grocery shopping. I mean, that, that brings me joy too. Okay. When, when you're working out, I'm curious, are you lifting? Are you doing cardio? What, what type of workout do you, are you doing? I'm better at lifting than cardio. Um, I've okay. done cardio in the past, but it's not my forte, to be honest. Yeah. I, don't, I hate it. I just kind of do it as a necessity. Um, but I, I love new workout challenges too. So that's another thing. So like I said, it, it all comes together, right? Challenges. I, I love it, you know? Yeah. So, okay. but I've been, but, but been working out since what I was 16. Um, you know, so but I just, the thing that I love doing. Yeah. That's good. Just weight lifting then mostly. Yeah. Yeah. Miles, if people want to reach out, learn more about you and eight miles, where, where can they go to please? Yep. So I'm at eight miles.com. Um, you can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at eight miles, LLC, uh, Facebook, same thing slash eight miles, LLC there too. Awesome. Miles, thank you so much, man, for coming on. I had a great time. Yeah, man. Like I said, I love doing these. I'm glad you had me. Of course. The pleasure's online. Take care. You too, Otto. Mm -hmm.